Hey everyone, today I'm going to be showing you how acoustic levitation really works and why it's probably not as straightforward as it's usually explained. So if you take an ultrasonic transducer like this and you put a surface above it for it to reflect the sound wave off, you can actually create a standing wave pattern in there. And if you take some small pieces of things like pieces of paper or small pieces of styrofoam, you can stick them in there and they actually levitate in the standing wave. What's really cool about this setup that I have here is normally if you have a flat transducer, you have to get the reflector almost the perfect distance away from it. If it's not a multiple of a half a wavelength away from the transducer, then you won't be able to get the standing wave. But in my case, pretty much wherever I set my reflector, it's able to set up a standing wave pattern. That's because the transducer is a little bit parabolic and so it can easily set up a standing wave even if you're not an exact multiple away from it. So it's really easy to set up the standing wave pattern with these transducers. Also, instead of a reflector, we could just put a second transducer up top of it, playing the same wave. And if we do that, we get a little bit stronger levitation. Okay, let's see how many we can fit in here. One. Two. Three. Four. Look how cool that is. You can even pop them up to the other nodes. Now let's prove that this is actually sound waves generating this levitation. Let's put it in my vacuum chamber and see how low of pressure we can get before we don't get any levitation. Okay, now I've got it set up in my vacuum chamber. The wires are connected to here and here. I'm just gonna power it up. Let's see what it looks like in air and then see what happens as I lower the pressure. Okay, it seems a little bit unstable in there. It might be echoing off of the vacuum chamber walls, so it makes the pressure waves a little more unstable. Okay, let's turn on the vacuum pump. We're at one bar, so one bar is about one atmosphere. So we can see what happens as the pressure drops. Three, two, one. 0.8 bar, it's actually getting more stable. about a half an atmosphere. Point three. Point two. Oh, we lost one and gone. So with this vacuum chamber experiment, we know that it's sound waves that's causing these particles to levitate. But the question is, how are they levitating there? Why would they levitate at that specific point? And are they levitating at the node or the anti-node of the standing wave in there? Now to understand how this is working, first we have to know that sound is a wave, but it's not the wave that you're normally used to. So this is called a transverse wave, and that's not what sound does, but rather sound is something called a longitudinal wave. And a longitudinal wave is shown on this end here. You can see that when I turn this, these end sticks get grouped together and then they get stretched apart. Because sound is generated by vibrating things, let's say you have some drum and you move it, it pushes the air close together and then when it moves back, it stretches that air out. So it has regions of high and low pressure. So a good way to mimic a sound wave is with a slinky. So instead of waving a slinky back and forth like this, to create a sound wave, you have to push the slinky and pull it back. So you can see that when I give this a push, you can see a wave travel to the end and come back. So you can see on this slinky system here, when I push it and then pull it back, the rings of the slinky can get squished together and you can see that squished together part move, ricochet off the end and then move backwards. This is what a pressure wave or a sound wave looks like traveling through the air. So now let's try to set up something in which we had our transducer at the bottom creating the sound and a reflector at the top. Well, if I vibrate my slinky at just the right frequency, you'll notice that we don't just see waves traveling back and forth, but we actually get something called a standing wave. 
And a standing wave occurs when the reflection is coming back at just at the right time when you're sending another wave, and so it creates an alternating region of high and low pressure. Or in the case of the slinky, it creates an alternating region of squished together rings and stretched apart rings. The places where the slinky rings are getting squished together and then stretched apart is called the antinode. And the places where the slinky rings are about the same distance apart always is called the node. The nodes are right in between the antinodes. So the antinodes have alternating positive and negative pressure and the nodes have a constant pressure. But you'll notice that right in the middle of the antinode is actually the place where there's least movement of the slinky rings. And right in the middle of the node is where there's maximum movement of the slinky rings. So this is where the question arises. If we were to put a particle in this moving slinky, which way would it be forced to move? Would it go to the region where there's alternating high and low pressure, but no movement of the slinky? Or would it go to the region where there's maximum movement of the slinky, but about average pressure? For example, if I stick a ball in this portion of the slinky, you could argue that the slinky's moving back and forth really fast, and so it's going to hit that particle and push it towards the regions that's not moving very fast. This is called the ponderomotive force. Now this argument makes fundamental sense, and it's the way in which you can trap particles with the electromagnetic force in ion traps. So if this were the case, we would expect that we're actually trapping the particles in the anti-nodes of the pressure waves on our acoustic setup. But when we actually measure the standing pressure wave that's created in this setup, you'll find that the particles actually settle in the nodes of the pressure waves, not in the anti-nodes. And the reason this happens is due to something else called the acoustic radiation pressure. So the other argument that we can make is that the anti-node of the pressure wave, you'll notice that there's a pressure gradient. For example, look at this slinky setup here. This is the high pressure and this is the low pressure. So there's going to be a pressure force on this side of the particle pushing it this way. And then when the anti-node switches, it's going to have a pressure pushing it the other way. So overall, the driving force is gonna push it towards the pressure node here. So the reason that our particles are settling in the nodes of the standing pressure wave as opposed to the anti-nodes is because of the acoustic pressure pushing it towards the node. But what about the ponderomotive force that we talked about earlier? What about how fast those particles are moving in the node? Well, it turns out that if your particle is smaller than around 10% of the wavelength, it's actually going to get pushed towards the anti-node. The ponderomotive force is going to be stronger than the radiation pressure pushing it towards the node. So what this means is that for really small particles, they're going to settle in the anti-nodes, but for large particles, they're gonna settle in the nodes. So you have this balancing act between the air molecules vibrating back and forth in this standing wave, and also the pressure that's created in those standing waves. And depending on how big your particle is, if it's larger, the pressure's gonna play a larger effect, but if it's smaller, the tiny movement of those air molecules is gonna play a larger role. Before we continue with this experiment, I'd like to thank the sponsor for this video, Klima. It's clear that our climate is changing. Have you ever wondered how much you're having an impact on climate change? Well, with a monthly subscription with Klima, you can plant trees and promote green energy projects and even improve lives around the globe. With Klima's app, you can calculate your carbon footprint in just three minutes. So I produce a little bit less than the average American, but way more than the average person in the world. And then you can fund climate projects that capture or reduce the same emissions elsewhere. And you can even learn how to reduce your footprint further one lifestyle change at a time. And also you can share the app with your friends so you can see how your influence multiplies with others. So come and join me and go carbon neutral with Klima today. Just click the link in my description and download the app. And after you've calculated your carbon footprint, type in the code ACTIONLAB10 and you'll get 10 extra trees planted in your name. And thanks again for watching another episode of the Action Lab and we'll see you next time.